This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you for joining me today. With me is Richard Fields in the middle, John Cameron down on the other end. And gentlemen, (laughs) what the heck was that? (laughs) John, what are you doing over there? We'll blame you. Not a sound that come from my, no. (laughs) We're, we're going to blame you for it anyway, though, John, just yeah. because. Well, if you're going to blame me, then. <laughs> well, that's pretty much what the uh, the um, prosecutor in Philadelphia and mayor have said to um, the people of Philadelphia. The, oh, we're talking about the politics of misinformation these days, but we have this story out of Philadelphia, that the mayor and the prosecutor are essentially denying that there's this ongoing surge of violence and criminality going through the city. I think there's now a new record, 521 people, I think was the, of murders, just murders in um, in Philadelphia. And yet, like so many other politicians, you know, we've talked about politicians who are denying the, uh, oh, inflation. We now have politicians denying crime, the increase in crime. We saw AOC do it before. There was no smashing gaps, grabs. And now we have prosecutors who are claiming that there's no increase in violence in their cities. And it's just, it's become absurd. What do you think about that, John, Richard? Wow, I'm all over the place today. Well, I, I, it's interesting. I there, there was, there's, for a long time, there was, like, I think, a conservative or a quasi-conservative guy that uh, that uh, promote, promulgated the, the broken window theory. And the broken window theory was that you uh, prosecute minor crimes, broken windows, uh, in the example, or, you know, uh, just, you know, public nuisance kind of crimes. Uh, the theory was that if you lock up the people that are doing, uh, you know, minor crimes, you're also locking up the people who would uh, also be doing major crimes or or would progress to major crimes. That's pretty much been debunked, I think. Uh, and we have now a situation where we have so many laws on the books, uh, both minor crime laws and uh, obviously serious crime laws, that the uh, cops are way too busy uh, going after and prosecuting uh, the the minor crimes uh, in many cases and don't have the manpower or the time to go at, to actually go after real crime. So it's kind of a, a, a multi-headed hydra. We do have a lot of real crime going on, and the causes are various, including the uh, the uh, the social dislocations and uh, cultural upside downness caused by the uh, the lockdowns uh, in small in no small part. Uh, but uh, you you know we, we just got a, a really really strange situation going on right now where real serious crimes, whether it's uh, uh, murder or whether it's uh, uh, well even shoplifting is not prosecuted if it's under what nine hundred dollars or something like that in San Francisco and probably other jurisdictions mm-hmm. so it's just a, a very a very strange uh, attitude that we have toward uh, law and order right now but we still have plenty of people to go after uh, uh, people who are waiting across the Rio Grande or who are uh, uh, doing minor very minor crimes like uh, like uh, indulging in their favorite recreational uh, drugs. Yeah, I think the the you know we for for the viewers' edification we send around articles so that we can actually read about the stuff before we talk about it. And and the the article I don't I don't remember the source of it was the former mayor was talking about it and he listed that he's he's he said I'm I'm a black man from a black neighborhood. Uh, and you know we we like the police um, as long as they treat us with respect. And he said the two things we want um, from from policing is that we're treated with respect, and uh, that we're not you know preyed upon because of the color of our skin. I'm paraphrasing him, and that was the first thing he listed. He listed two things, and the second thing is we want to be safe. We want to be safe to go to the store. We want to be safe to go to the park. We want to be safe in our ne- neighborhood. So, you know, the idea, all this defund the police thing and, you know, the, the idea that that uh, black people especially hate police is is a complete regressive fallacy, what other people call progressives. And I'm not going to call them liberals because, you know, they're not. It's um, 
the, the, the people who, who are making these policies uh, typically uh, went away to school and stayed in the dorm and, and got a degree and lived in an upper middle class or upper class home, and they didn't see crime. They weren't affected by crime. They didn't have people uh, dealing, you know, uh, heroin on the street corner. They didn't have people uh, breaking into their house when they went out for a meal. They, they weren't worried about their kids playing uh, hoops and being shot by drive-bys. So, you know, their, their, their window on crime is, or their window on the police is these police uh, persecuting people of color. But people of color are uh, the people generally most affected by crime and the most, um, the, the, the group of people who are, are most eager to have an effective police force as long as they're they're policing against these crimes, as Richard said, regulations. One of the things they don't want, based upon um, I forget the guy's name. Who is the VP candidate for Libertarian Party? Mike Great Cohen. Mike Cohen. Cohen. Cohen said when they went when they went you know door to door prior to the election, talking about what people wanted, they they thought that that they were going to hear a lot of this disband the police and defund the police and 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 what they said was no no we want the police to fight crime because we have a lot of violence we have murders we have muggings we have break-ins we have burglaries we have shoplifting and we can't live our lives if we're in fear of those but what they're doing is 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 prosecuting us trying to uh build our side hustle into a big business Richard said, all these regulations that keep are keeping the black man down. I mean, they can't afford to, to <clears throat> go put themselves through contractor school or get licensed to be a mechanic. They can't, uh, uh, you know, arrange by bank financing to lease a building. So they have to start their operation in their house. And, and the man is keeping them from lifting themselves up, but not prosecuting these crimes that have a direct impact on the community. So as Richard said, it's upside down. Um, and, and until we get the, the regulators off people's backs and the, and the police uh, focusing, you know, fewer police probably would be needed if they weren't, if they weren't um, you know, prosecuting people, people violating regulations. I mean, the, in Sacramento, where I live, they had stings all the time because the contractor state license board here, they would set up fake, fake homeowners um, and have people come in and bid on the job, and if they weren't licensed contractors, they'd handcuff them, take them off to jail. I mean, that's not what police are supposed to do. Police are supposed to follow up on the burglaries and prevent the rapes and prevent the burglaries and follow up on the murders and prevent the murders, and that's just not happening. The purpose of criminal law is to protect us from others, not to protect us from ourselves. Yeah. We can do a very good job of protecting ourselves from ourselves. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, uh, we're yeah, the political, I'm sorry, John, but the political class is so interested in social engineering nowadays that they've forgotten that their job is, you know, isn't to engineer uh, the future. It's their job is to take care of the things that the issues that need to be dealt with right now. Like, you know, can we make the sewers work? Can we make the, can we, you know, can we just do the basics? Can we make sure the potholes get filled up? Can we make sure the well, police are out there exactly dealing with rapes and murders and not dealing with, is your grass too long? You know, that's that's the kind of thing that we should be dealt with. Yeah. And it's becoming harder and harder to know what we can and cannot discuss. And if you can't discuss something, how can we trust it? And Twitter has now, what, suspended the account of, oh, I forget his name. I'm blanking on his, on the, the, the doctor who was part of the team that created the MNRA technology that the vaccines are... Uh, based upon i think my yeah doc, dr robert malone yeah, yeah. Robert malone. Dr. Malone. thank you richard one of the inventors of the vaccine yeah yeah one of the vaccine technology it wasn't the actual vaccine but the technology that the vaccine was based upon so yeah, he, the, the he mrna technology, right. right he knows how it works but yeah. how are we supposed to trust something i mean if we can't discuss it how are we supposed to build trust in science build trust in in institutions and build trust in in vaccines if we're not allowed to discuss the various you know, goods, bads, and indifferences. If all we're supposed to allow to discuss is what the government says we're allowed to discuss. Well, yeah, I mean, what we're doing right. is, is we're reverting back to the 70s and 80s and before. Uh, we had a, uh, a golden age of free flow of information when the internet was new and unregulated, essentially, 
uh, did people on the internet did their own thing. Nobody was censoring what was said on the internet, whether it was Twitter or Facebook or YouTube or uh, any other uh, form of. Uh, well, none of those things were around, though. but anyway, yeah. And uh, prior to the uh, advent of the of the uh, of the internet, uh, and we had essentially three major news uh, major TV networks: ABC, NBC, CBS, and their cable affiliates and two or three newspapers, the New York Times, Washington Post, maybe the LA Times, that essentially had monopoly control over what was said in the public square. And that monopoly control was dictated uh, through winks and nudges and uh, strong arm tactics, uh, antitrust, uh, you know, threats of antitrust enforcement, that sort of thing, by the uh, federal and to a lesser extent state governments. So prior to the internet being a thing, we had a soft censorship by the government. The government really didn't like uh, the free flow of information that resulted from the internet. And now we're seeing soft censorship by the government uh, exercised through uh, the threat of regulation, the threat of uh, antitrust enforcement, et cetera, uh, on the platforms that people have been or had been using to uh, uh, freely express their opinions, that namely uh, Twitter, Facebook, etc. Uh, and uh, you know, it's it's a it's a sad situation where the government is able to shut down platforms uh, simply through the threat of regulation. Now there are a few platforms that are that are fighting back. There's Substack, uh, and there and some others uh, that are uh, allowing people like Glenn Greenwald, the guy that broke the Edward Snowden story, like. Uh, uh, others, you know, like Edward Snowden himself, uh, and, and you know, and, and uh, the guy that used to write for the, uh, Matt Taibbi, the guy that used to write for the Rolling Stone, and broke a lot of uh, financial stories back in the uh, in the middle of the 2000 aughts. Uh, those people have now, since you know they were they were groundbreakers at the time, and they're still breaking ground. But now they're breaking ground in reporting on things that the government doesn't want. Uh, anybody to hear about, and so they're being relegated off mainstream news sites, off, certainly off the uh, you know the mainstream media, and now off the uh, the major uh, uh, platforms uh, on the internet, and you know pushed to places like Substack, which is a really good source of information. And I I, I agree with Richard again twice in the same show um, about you know the history of this thing. But what what's this this in a way is a good thing because uh, once people realize that they're getting censored information through these uh, through these um, excuse me through the uh, you know Twitter and other places like that and Twitter when they when they um, um, block this guy from Twitter because he has like half a million followers and he's a you know a, a very well-respected scientists. They didn't. They they didn't tell them why they were doing it. They just did it. Um, and there's some people who are suing, you know, Twitter, stating that they're a messenger service like the postal service, so they have to, you know, publish anything, and they can't censor it. I disagree with that. It's a private company and do whatever they want. But the nice thing is, is that when private companies do whatever they want, and and it stops them doing the mission that people. Uh, use them for, which is the, the exchange of information and ideas, uh, once they start editing that information, just like Google is doing with its search terms, then things like Dr. Go pop up. You know, the, 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 the market will provide an alternative. I haven't investigated Substack, but now I'm going to. Um, you know, I, I used to do all my search on Google until it stopped sending me where I wanted to go, but where it wanted to go. Now I use Dr. Go. Um, you know, and, and the market will out. The market will, uh, you know, people want to be able to, you know, people at their core want their beliefs reinforced, but they also want to find out information. And, and if these sources aren't letting them find out that information and they find another source that will, they're going to go to that source. So it's, it's in, in kind of in, kind of in a squirrely way, it's a good thing. Because some of these major players like Facebook, you know, kids aren't using Facebook anymore. They're, you know, you can't delete your account or they would be deleting your accounts. 
you know, they're going to other places. Unfortunately, some of them are owned by Facebook. But the, these things, you know, the, uh, competitors will come in and we'll, we'll have the ability to hear the truth and speak the truth. It'll happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the issue is, I guess, is it really the doing these things of their own free will? If Twitter is really doing this of their own free will, then it's, it's kind of fine. But if they're doing going in these measures as in response to the threat of regulation or because the you know the administration called up and says we want this taken down as they said they've done you know then that's a whole different story and so there's a there's a balance there that i think we have to be careful not yeah to no, I, I don't think there's any question that, that uh, twitter in particular uh, particularly twitter in the uh, uh before jack dorsey uh resigned was uh you know, very good on uh, allowing people to do what they wanted to do for the most part. Facebook, not so much. Facebook has been a tool for the left for really for uh, since its inception, or, you know, since it started to matter. Uh, but, but you know, now that you know, Dorsey's uh, gone from, from Twitter, Twitter is following the same uh, playbook as is uh, as are the rest of the social media, which is if the government says jump, they say how high. And then well, you know, a lot of the providers, the other the other providers of you know, intellectual property and, and actually useful technology, Apple for one. I love Apple devices, but I'm quite upset about what they're doing in China. You know, basically they're kowtowing to the Chinese government uh, in order to you know sell their sell their their goods in China. And you know, I know they need to provide a profit to their shareholders, but man. Man, at what cost, right? And speaking of what cost, the human costs of the Afghan Afghanistan war are kind of well known. We even kind of sort of know how much it cost from a dollar sense. But what we don't know is how much it costs on like an inflationary terms and how much does that whole 20 year endeavor, uh, how much did it actually cost us in terms of all the other terms, the soft costs, as we should have called it. I know one of you guys wanted to make sure we caught this. So. I think, I, yeah, I think that the soft cost is the uh, contribution that funding the war on terror, Afghanistan in particular, has contributed to the uh, money creation that causes inflation. Mm -hmm. And uh, inflation is simply another uh, backdoor tax. It raises uh, money by uh, making you pay more for your, your post toasties. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, you're not paying it directly to the government, but you're paying it uh, you know, indirectly to the government through uh, more government borrowing uh, funded by funding money created by the Fed. And, uh, and, and like all wars, uh, Vietnam War, even, you know, good wars, supposedly good wars like World War II, the, the real cost is never known until you've made the last payment to the last veteran that served in that war for their uh, health care and PTSD and, and so on and so forth. So uh, the cost of Afghanistan will probably be a multiple of what we of, of what's being reported now in terms of uh, guns and bombs. Yeah. And then the, I guess the, the dollar, we should throw around some dollar terms here, I think. The the quote unquote hard cost is uh, estimated at, I mean, hard financial cost. Uh, two trillion dollars. But if you factor in the fact that they're, you know, that the, the powers that we let be are printing the money to pay for it, they're not in in World War II. They they uh, sold bonds and borrowed money and paid it back. Uh, heaven forbid. And it took years and years and years to do it, but they did it. Um, here we're just printing it, and uh, that print printing of that money causes inflation, as we all know. And once again, the people who are most uh, hurt by inflation are um, underrepresented groups, people of color, uh, new immigrants, people on the bottom end of the, the financial and social spectrum because they don't have financial assets they're appreciating. They don't own uh, gold. They don't own Bitcoin. They don't own real property. So when inflation hits, it hits them. Uh, in the gas prices, it hits them, them in the cost of, of diapers and food and all the rest of that. And that's that's what makes it horrible. And then one of the costs that we don't talk about, but we've talked about a little bit, is just the, not that I want our government engaged in foreign, in, uh, you know, gunship diplomacy, they used to call it. Um, but, you know, the, the fact that, that uh, you know, this, it's how poorly misrun the whole war was and the idea that we were there to build a nation 
and they let this lunatic general do that for years and thought it was a great idea. And then he left and, and he said, well, let's just leave. And, and you know, it was, it was bad. So there's lots of costs for this thing. And, and hopefully these costs will, will uh, keep us from doing this kind of foolishness. I hope. Yeah. Sorry, I just had the fire engines just come screaming down my street. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, we don't really know the cost. You know, we, we've printed all this money. We paid for it with debt instead of paying for it with, you know, the normal ways. And we just aren't going to know how much this costs us until, what I'm dead probably. Hmm. You know, I'm 52 years old. I'll probably be 80 before we really figure out how much all this cost on both a human and a my financial terms because we still don't know the human cost. I mean, we think we do, but we really don't. We've destroyed a culture and I don't think there's a, a dollar figure that can be put on that. Hmm. And Richard, Richard mentioned something and then I'll, I'll stop in like 30 seconds. If I can do this in 30 seconds. Um, a lot of the troops there were, were straight infantry troops and the, their, their combat loads were upwards of 150 pounds. Uh, if you count what they carried on their back and their weapons and their ammunition and their um, their body armor and all the rest of that stuff. And and I read somewhere, I don't have it in front of me, so don't get mad at me, powers will be let be if I'm misquoting this number. But over half of those people have back injuries. Um, and not, you know, not from getting shot, you know, not from doing anything other than carrying way more weight up way steeper hills and down, which is even worse than the human body is designed to do, even if you're young and tough, at altitude. Um, and so that, when you talk about some long-term financial costs for America, taking care of, what is it, 50,000 young men now with bad backs until they're in the ground, you know, much less the cost to them, they're not going to be able to hold down certain jobs and all the rest of that stuff. So they're just the costs are abysmal and let's just not do this anymore let's make sure we don't let our politicians do this anymore good luck with that with the war clouds uh, uh gathering in in uh, ukraine china mm. taiwan elsewhere mm. well i think i think there'd be a quick way to fix it um and that is uh change the draft laws to where only women can serve in combat arms and the they they would make sure that they're not sent I, well no only 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 uh, children of congressmen or yeah, well, <laughs> I think they'd send their own kids to, to war if their checks were going to be big enough. Mm. Um, but speaking of big checks, California has entered into a zoning reform. Now, I'm personally kind of skeptical on California and these politicians zoning reform because the reforming these are quite literally the same people who instituted these zoning problems are now fixing these zoning problems when they're state legislators, and so it's. I've got to guess that the real goal of this zoning reform here in California is not actually to create more housing as we as libertarians would like to see it. What they want to do is they want to take a house that's worth $500,000, divide that property into two or three and not have two houses that are $250,000. They want two $500,000 houses because it pays for the tax guy. I, I just, you know, I well, no, we're getting no, rid of no, regulations, but I am skeptical that this is isn't just but a money grab. Now, James, when you when you tell the dog to fetch and he fetches, uh, don't hit the dog. Uh, I'm just skeptical just that they're because, doing this for the right reason. Because, That's all. That's all I'm saying. These, these clowns made bad laws. Don't assume the bad motive that uh, they you know the the other motive might be that they figured out uh, you know very late in the game that they made some bad laws, made some bad uh, policy decisions and have uh, heard from their constituents to uh, in a loud enough volume that they're actually going to, to fix the problems that they've caused. Uh, that's, that's the optimistic view. I realize it's the, uh, it's the Pollyanna. Richard, where, where did you hide Richard? Where's the pot? <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, you know, I think I think whenever whenever Newsom and uh, the Democratic legislators do a good thing, yeah, you, know, you know, we might secretly believe that their motives are not good. But hey, they did a good thing at least incrementally. Let's congratulate them, give them some attaboys, and say do do more of it. Hmm. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Yeah, I'd love to be 
you know, look on on the bright side on this one, Richard. But I'm I'm sure after they push all these things through, they'll sneak in a little bill that says that you have to pay uh, uh, what is it comparable wage, which means that all of these these things have to be built with paying union labor, or only with. Yeah, uh, I mean, so, nothing, and then the you know the 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 NIMBY stuff, not in my backyard. Um, you know, there's going to be so much resistance in the neighborhoods and the local town councils. Anyway, a lot of it will be a lot of it will be sabotaged. But I think, despite all that, some will trickle through. We'll get some more housing in California. I doubt very seriously if the 330,000 people who left California last year will look and see, oh, housing prices are now no longer triple anywhere else; they're only double. I'm going to move back. But you know, who knows? Maybe, maybe. Yeah, I'm just maybe I'm a little skeptical, I'm just, <laughs> but but you know I go I follow the money. I, I'm following the money here, and I'm going. It, this the only person that's going to you know at least initially is going to benefit from this is the tax collector. Now maybe over time, you know maybe over the course of time, if we ever get politicians who will accept the fact that housing prices have to stabilize, you don't even necessarily have to decrease them. You can just stop them from growing at this insane rate that we've had here for the last, what, 20 years that our no growth policies have foisted upon us. We've had this no growth policy plus this love affair with ever increasing property values. And we're surprised that housing is unaffordable. I, you know, I just, <laughs> just, you've got to wonder sometimes, do these people actually exist in the real world? They well, they, we don't have to wonder that they don't exist in the real world. They exist in the, in the world of politics. And, and uh, none of them, most of them, very, very few of them, some of the right wing uh, politicians have actually been engaged in business as in real business, not monkey business of, you know, being a lobbyist or an attorney or something like that, but actually run a farm or a factory or hired people or created jobs. And those people have a little bit of understanding of reality, uh, but the rest of them, no, not at all. They, they fully believe that, um, you know, they can pass a law and through passing a law, something will happen and, and it will be close to their stated reasoning. Or if and, and there will be no trade-offs, no, no uh, so-called unintended consequences. Which unintended. Well, cases, then, I think which many all... cases are intended from the get-go. Well, well all unintended consequences are we are now out of time. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Thank you all for watching us. And please remember to love everybody. Sounds like a plan. Thank, thank you. you. Reminded of that. I, I appreciate it. Thank you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint. Listen each week in Sacramento on Comcast Channel 17 for Knuckleheads of Liberty on Monday at 5.30 p.m. and the Libertarian Counterpoint show on Thursday at 8 p.m. Also on YouTube, Facebook, and podcasts everywhere. Please visit us at http colon slash slash www.libertariancounterpoint.com. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint Productions.